Hello there! Welcome to episode 15 of my Dead by Daylight series. Today, we are exploring the Demise of the Faithful chapter, which brought us a, again, a brand new killer in the form of the Plague, and a new survivor in the form of Jane Romero. So, as always, we're going to jump in with Survivor first, and let's have a look at Jane. So here we have Jane Romero. Let's have a look at her backstory and her perks. So Jane Romero was the daughter of a famous actress, Loretta Lawrence, of whom she had no memory. Her parents had separated when she was still a baby, mainly since her mother was often away filming. Jane was raised by her father, a struggling visual artist. She grew up torn between resenting her mother's absence from her life and admiring her presence on screen. As a teenager, Jane secretly wished to emulate her mother's talent. She would direct and perform in plays, audition for TV commercials and help her father at his studio. During her senior year, she entered a national oratory contest and won first prize. Her performance attracted the attention of a radio station that contacted her for an interview. During the live show, her natural charm and repartee impressed the staff who offered her a part-time job at the station. After graduating college in communication, she quit her job at the station to work for a trendy variety show. But her frank delivery and ad-libs were not appreciated by the show's executives who fired her after five months. Desperate for another opportunity, Jane pitched the show at the radio station she used to work at, only to be turned down, her, pro her proposal being too risky. Four months later, she received a phone call from a producer who had seen reruns of the show. He was looking for the co-host to spark up the failing show, Quick Talk. Live television meant long hours, a low salary and no stability, but it also offered a platform to broadcast her views. She disputed the crude inflammatory tone of Quick Talk and pushed for the relatable coverage of personal issues. Her honest delivery re resonated with her audience and within weeks the show's viewership was steadily growing. After two years, she launched a full hour segment called The Jane Romero Show, which was broadcast nationally and covered tabooed topics, including her personal struggle with abandonment. Her show broke records and her initials JR became synonymous with products ranging from beauty creams to fashion accessories. But Jane needed more. She wanted others to follow in her footsteps. She published a memoir that covered her childhood with an absent mother, her book was an instant bestseller but was reviewed harshly. Critics called it a serving of sad anecdotes seasoned with bland genetic self-help tips. Jane took this criticism to heart since despite her success, her voice in the back of her mind was starting to doubt her achievements. Her success also generated an increasingly demanding schedule and a glowing pressure to entertain constantly. During a particularly tense week, she canned an episode and instead launched a two hour long special on divorce. Her stress peaked when she learned that her mother had agreed to star in her show. Jane put on a brave face and began the show. Most of it went without a hitch, but when her mother walked on set, smiling warmly at the audience, Jane's stomach lurched unpleasantly. She was consumed by a violent envy that had been festering, yet she carried on with a strained smile until Loretta interrupted her, saying that they were not actually related. The interview went haywire after that. After the show, Jane was driving to her father's house in New Jersey. She needed to talk things over with him. She had not been feeling like herself lately. She turned on a freeway along the coast to avoid major congestion and popped some painkillers to numb the throbbing pain in her temples, which had been nagging her all day. Then she started to relax and turned on the radio. Classical music was playing. The drive was slow. Black ice covered the highway which was packed with cars on the way back home. Night fell. A darkness began to blur the corners of her vision and turn the headlights into swirls of red. Jane blinked to sharpen their outlines, but each time she closed her eyes, her eyelids became heavier and slower until they remained shut for a moment too long. The following morning, authorities were fishing out Jane's car from the water. Despite leading a meticulous search, for weeks they were unable to retrieve her body. The airing and production of the Jane Romero show was suspended until after her funeral, which her father and mother attended. 
As the public grieved for Jane, there was a surge of orders for JR products and all her episodes were re-released a month later, with an opening credit that wished her eternal peace. Damn. So they all think she's dead? That's not nice. Anyways. <coughs> she's considered an intermediate character to play as. Let's have a look at the perks. So we got Solidarity. Sharing painful experience has the power to heal. While injured, healing a survivor without using a medkit also heals you at 40% conversion rate. Second, we have Poised. Achieving goals boosts your confidence. After generator is completed, you leave no scratch marks for 6 seconds. And finally, we have Head On. When your mind is set, there is no there, there better be no one standing in your way. While standing in a locker for 3 seconds, Head On activates. While Head On is activated, perform a rush action to leave locker to use Head On. If the killer is standing within Head On's effective range, the killer is stunned for 3 seconds, causing the exhausted static effect for 60 seconds. Head On cannot be used while exhausted. You do not recover from the exhausted static effect while running, and Head On cannot be used when you have idle crows. Interesting. So let's jump into a game, and let's see if we can survive using Jane's perks. Then we can move on to the killer. Oh. Ah, that was lucky, isn't it? Need to take off that perk, because that's not one. So we've got head on rank 3, poise rank 3, and... So we've got Jane's perks rank 3 in all, because I'm a, a survivor mainer. Ah, so we have Adam Francis, Derek King, and Jill Valentine. Who will win and who will die? Nobody knows until we find out. And Jill quit. Good start. <laughs> and here's Bill. Bill, it would be nice if you readied up so that we don't have to wait 40 seconds. No? Okay then. No. <coughs> that Bill's quit as well. Okay, so we have a Dwight now. Is Dwight going to ready up? No. Just hit, just hit ready up for God's sake. Great, so I've got to sit in half another 25 seconds because someone doesn't want to ready up. Three sacrificial cakes.
Why would you use the Huntress Lullaby? Oh my god! Oh, it's Pyramid Head, is it? Well, I already have found some totems. Let's go and rescue her, Dwight, shall we? Oh, this guy's not messing around, is he? Damn, two people hooked and not one jelly's been done. Can we do a generator, please, for the lo love of everything that is holy? Oh, really? Hi there! Yes, I am the only one you have not touched yet. And you cannot put me in a cage because I did not run through your crap. Pallet there. Lovely. Thank you. Now we should do this generator. Damn it. Five hooks.
I don't think I'm going to survive this, to be honest. Shit! If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die do my challenge. Bollocks. You will follow me, my friend. Sounds like brutal strength, maybe? I don't know. I have not escaped. How dare you lie to me, game! Oh, nice! Nice, you got me! About time. Uh, uh, I'm in a cage! Help me! Thank you. 
Wow, these televisions were so close. got the thingy as well then. No, he's not going to let me out. I'm going to die. Here. Yeah. Final judgment time. Oh, no, I'm not thingy, am I? Oh, well. Yeah, it's a hook right there, matey. Blech. Good game, good game. I'm the only one he couldn't body. Oh well. At least I got me blind the killer. Oh, I did it twice? Okay. Let's see. Level 13. Not bad. Okay, so barbecue and chili, monster and abuse, brutal strength, predator. I was right about brutal strength. That's a win win for me. Nah, not really, it's a loss. But that was Jane Romero, so let's go straight into the killer round and have a look at the plague. So, this is my plague at the moment. Let's have a look at the backstory, shall we? When she was five years old, Adelis, the youngest of a family of seven, was on, left on the brink red burning steps of the Temple of Purgation at the centre of Babylon. The process her sh oh, sorry to process her shock and sorrow she held on to the belief that the gods had a plan for her her new life was one of quiet servitude she would tend to the gardens prepare ceremonial meals and polish ceremonial incense burners at night she would pray for the sign that would reveal her purpose when she came of age she attended the high-ranking priest during the yearly worshipping of a sea goat the god of water and creation swinging a censer down the great Hyperstyle hall, she cast thick black fumes that reached the cold, towering stone pillars before dissipating. Her worries lifted, and the resulting bliss made her feel closer to the gods than ever. She worked herself to the bone each day that followed, fulfilling her duties while taking on new ones as she aided the priests during purification rituals. The priests were more and more in need of assistance. Cleansings were being performed daily to answer the demand from outside the high temple walls where a catastrophic plague had resurfaced. Within months, the priests contracted the disease. It did not take long before they became too weak to perform any kind of ritual. Adiris, having assisted many purification rituals, was the only one able to carry on. The swelling panic had to be contained, even if by a novice. Anxious before her first ceremony, Adiris visited the priest's sanctuary chamber. When she lit the candles, she noticed a narrow opening at the back. Sliding through the gap, she reached a crypt hidden under the sanctuary. The chamber was bare except for the golden statue of a woman who stood with outstretched hands, her fingers covered in jewels. It was the sign Adelis had been waiting for. 
The great hall was packed with followers who bowed down as Adiris entered. She strode to the brick altar and grabbed a ceremonial dagger forged in silver, her ruby ringed fingers wrapping around the blade like claws. The sudden display of luxury intrigued the followers who were struck already by her youth and beauty. As she began reciting the epic of creation, a woman at the back swooned and collapsed. Adiris rushed to her and noticed the black blisters covering her feet. Without hesitation, Adiris grabbed a sacred blade and swung it at her own foot, severing a toe. Then she offered the bloody part to the gods, asking them to protect the woman. A silence fell over the followers, who revered Adiris as their new priestess. Tales of her wealth, beauty and devotion began to spread across the city as quickly as the disease. Soon, Adiris' followers called her the High Priestess of Babylon. But her faith was tried when she showed the first signs of infection. Her cough became a mix of phlegm and blood. Her neck erupted in abscesses and her four-toed foot darkened. Ashamed of her condition, she began wearing a veiled headpiece and carried a censer that masked the rancid smell of sick and clang to her skin. Hoping to be saved, she kept performing the rituals, offering blessed water and food to her so followers. But no ritual could save her. In a desperate attempt to appease the gods, Adiris banished herself from the city. She travelled north with a few followers, venturing through the cold woodlands of Urashtu until it was no longer possible to walk. They camped in a deep cave where Adiris lay in a pool of vomit. Her foot, which had turned black, was so swollen she could not go any further. Her followers and she realised the truth in that cave. They were all infected with the plague. Kneeling among her wretched followers, Adiris made one last prayer. The black fumes of incense rose into the damp air before being wiped off by a cold breeze. Neither the body of Adiris nor her followers were ever found. Many told tales of her return, but no one truly knew what fate had befallen the High Priestess of Babylon. She's considered an intermediate killer to play us. So let's have a look at the perks next. So we've got Corrupt Intervention. Your players invoke a dark power that meddles with the survivor's chances of survival. Three generators located furthest away from you are blocked by the entity for 80 seconds at the start of the trial. Survivors cannot repair these generators for the duration. Affected generators are highlighted by a white aura. Then we have Infectious Fright. The cries of the unfaithful make your heart leap. Any survivors that are within your tenor radius while another survivor is put into the dying state will yell and reveal their location to you for 4 seconds. And finally we have Dark Devotion. The display of your powers creates a whirlwind of panic that spreads throughout the land. You become obsessed with one survivor. Hitting the obsession with a basic attack transfer your, transfers your tenor radius to the obsession for 20 seconds and sets its radius to 32 meters. You are granted the undetectable status effect for the duration. The survivor with the transferred tenor radius is also considered to be inside the tenor radius for other purposes. The killer can only be obsessed with one survivor at a time. Finally, we have the Vile Purge power. Her condition deteriorated over as the plague overtook her body. Her toes blackened, her neck mushroomed into cysts, and her throat gagged with bloody vomit. Vile Purge. Infect environmental objects and survivors with Vile Purge to create an unending cycle of sickness. Press and hold the power button, char power button charge Vile Purge, and release the button to unleash a stream of infectious bile. Hitting a survivor will cause them to become infected. Hitting an environmental object will cause it to become infected for a short time. Survivors interacting with infected objects will also become infected. When a survivor's infection indicator is completely filled, the survivor is put into the injured state, is afflicted by the broken status effect, and forced to vomit at random intervals. Special ability in Jesh Corruption. Infected survivors can heal themselves to full health and cure their infection by cleansing a pool as a pool of devotion. This action corrupts the pool, allowing the plague to consume the corruption and empower her purge. Press and hold the interaction button while next to a corrupt pool of devotion to transform vile purge into corrupt purge. This action removes the corruption from the pool. Special attack corrupt purge. After using the ingest corruption ability, vile purge is replaced by corrupt purge and uh, corrupt purge for a short duration. Corrupt purge instantly damages any survivor hit by extreme. However, it no longer applies infection to survivors or environmental objects. So that's the plague. We're going to be playing as it. I've been searching for the game since I started reading all that. <laughs> so it would... Oh, hang on, what's that? Oh, that's a doctor's perk. I'm going to need that one. So we have level 1 corrupt intervention, level 1 dark devotion, and level 2 infectious flight. Yeah, 
So now, as always, it's a waiting game to get into a lobby. For some reason, it always takes longer for killers to get into a lobby. I don't know why, because there's more survivors out there than there are killers, I guess, maybe? Or well, there's not enough survivors for a killer? I don't know. I don't know why it takes so long to find a game as a killer. Should ultimately put me straight into a lobby. And there we go. We're in a lobby. Nice. Who have we got? We got Felix Richt Richt Richter, Dwight Far uh, Fairfield, Claudette Morel, and Jake Park. Good old JP. CM. And they're, either, they're all on a different platform to me. What do we have here? We have a sacrificial cake, sacrificial cake, and a sacrificial cake. <coughs> you wanted lore? Oh, you're getting it, all right. The archives have been such a big part of my life on DBD ever since I joined the team. I hope you're all enjoying it as much as the team is working on it. As the team is working on it is for you. Who is this mysterious observer, after all? I would like to know that, too. Cheats are never fair, and it's my job to eliminate them. Oh, look, that's the curtain call chapter. Ah, we're on Hawkins National Laboratory, I see. Oh god, I can't see. Oh my god. the one upstairs. Teleport? Oh, hello. Oh, did you think I was coming back up to get you?
I haven't seen anyone use decisive strike lately, to be honest. I don't know if that actually works, you know.
Always gotta love it when they do that. No! God damn it. Ah, oh, well. Claudette's probably at the other exit gate. Lovely jubbly camping around. Either that or she's looking for the hatch. Or sat on it. It's always fun. Damn, where was that? No idea where that was, but I still got the crown unlocked. Which is no point, because it doesn't unlock anything. <laughs> anyway, that was the plague. I was crap, as always, as the plague. That's why I don't really play as much. Probably need to do actually play as her, actually. Get a lot better. But yeah. So we had some... Oh, we had a nice uh, level 8 there. Not too bad. So, that's the end of this episode. Thank you all for watching. If you liked it, hit the like button. Let me know in the comments what other games you'd like to see me play in the future. And subscribe for more videos. But until two days time, I'll see you then in my next video. Bye for now.